with a life network. She is also a member of the guiding group of the Global Agenda for Sustainable Livestock. Nitya, the floor is yours. Thank you, Sabine. Good evening, good afternoon, good morning. <laughs> it's an honor and a privilege to be here today at the launch of the book, Livestock for a Small Planet. Thank you, LPP, for inviting me to share and celebrate this moment with you. I'm Nitya, and I'm the moderator for this session. The book is being launched at a momentous time. The COVID-19 pandemic continues to play havoc with lives. Climate change is becoming difficult to deny, even for die-hard climate deniers, and the UN Food System Summit has just been concluded. Livestock is an important subject, but can, can conjure different images in our minds and different emotions too. But a little more about that later. The program is as follows. Ilza will make a short presentation of her book and a distinguished panel specially invited for the session will discuss the book through questions which I will pose them. They will have five minutes to respond to the questions after which I will pose one question and then each of you will respond and then I will pose the second question. Ilza will respond to the first question and then the second question, the panelists one by one and then Ilza will have a chance to respond again. Finally, the floor will be open for questions from the audience. Please post your question in the chat box and we will take them one by one, time permitting. You may post your questions to Ilze or any of the panelists. The book is available online. It's on the chat if you look for it there. Uh, Paul, perhaps you'd like to post in the chat again and we're posting the link in the chat box. Please keep your audios and videos off so there is no disturbance while the presentations are being made. Thank you. I would now like to introduce the author, Ilza Kohler Rolofsen. Ilza is a veterinarian by training, but worked for 10 years as an archaeozoologist in Jordan, which provided her with a holistic perspective on the interaction between livestock ecologies and economies over time. After doing field work with Raika Camel Pastoralists in Rajasthan in India, she founded the League for Pastoral People, Peoples in 1992, initially to provide them with veterinary services. She soon expanded his scope to give a voice to small scale livestock keepers and pastoralists at the international level, especially with respect to rights over the genetic resources. She's worked extensively on several issues related to pastoralism and livestock systems in several parts of the world and has written extensively on the subject too. She spends most of her time in India where she co-founded co India's first dedicated camel dairy together with a partner. Currently, she's working on a book manuscript entitled Herding that will be published in 2023. Congratulations, Ilze, that's really very impressive. And as the moderator, do I have your permission to ask you a question? I'm gonna ask it anyway. What prompted you to write the book? You know, I, I got so tired of the polarization of the discussion on livestock. You know, I mean, like there are two different camps and they're totally opposed to each other and they don't talk to each other. And on one hand, other people who are totally against livestock, uh, and on the other hand, are the kind of the livestock apologists who uh, don't take any critique. And and so I'm I was also there was a lockdown, uh, so there was plenty of time to think about these things, and uh, I just put it all down. <laughs> Wonderful use of lock lockdown really productively. Uh, another question, please. The style of the book is different. Would you like to tell us a little more about how you decided on this particular style? Well. Uh, you know, I also um, wanted to address, uh, not, I mean, not just fellow, um, not just colleagues, but also the general public, because I see how a lot of young people are really confused. And uh, um, so I, I was just trying to, you know, provide some solid information on the options for livestock and, uh, yeah, for young people. Okay. Also, no? Yeah. Mm -hmm. For young people. Okay. Uh, perhaps you had, you also styled it after the book by Francis. Exactly. Yes, yes, yes. So, so sorry. Yeah, exactly. I mean, Francis book had a lot of uh, impact on me when I first read it and it's, it just had its 50th anniversary. So, uh, and I've met Francis at a meeting and she's a wonderful person. And uh, I just thought this was, uh, I don't know, just stuck in my mind that title. Oh. Wonderful. Okay. Yeah, the, I mean, it's now you can make your presentation. Thank you, Elsa. Yeah, okay, Paul, can you uh, share your screen, please? Thank you for that introduction, Nitya, and to give a brief, uh, to have the opportunity to give a brief overview of uh, Livestock for a Small Planet. 
uh, which basically consists of three parts. In the first part, I'm trying, I'm analyzing many of the general allegations against livestock that you find in popular media, but also in highly respected journals such as Science and even being promoted by UN agencies that, such as UNEP. The second part is a, is a critique of some of the fundamentals of livestock development where I try to identify what went wrong and why there is such a huge backlash against uh, livestock among the general public, especially young people. In the third part, this consists of suggested actions or goalposts that we should aim for to make livestock fit for the future and to align it with planetary boundaries. Next slide, please. So in the book I've taken up, uh, I've identified these nine uh, myths about livestock. And the first one, uh, the first one is about uh, livestock taking up too much land. And there was a statement even in Science ma uh, Magazine saying that if we all became vegan, the area used for food production could be reduced by 70% or so. And this is of course the perspective of developed countries with temperate climates, which does not consider that only about one third or a little over 30% uh, of the agricultural land is actually arable. In the remaining 60%, little bit more than 60%, it's only possible to produce food by means of livestock. And these are um, FAO figures. So if we stop keeping livestock, all the people living in those areas, basically we would condemn them to starvation. And this is about 1 billion people. But even in temperate areas in Europe, there are calculations showing that if we stopped eating all kind, uh, any kind of livestock products, we would actually need more land because we would lose the food that is produced by livestock from crop byproducts. There's a study from the University of Wageningen about that, which says that if we went vegan in the temperate areas, we would actually need more land. The, the, uh, so uh, there are nine points here. I can't go uh, through all of them, but I mean, the one thing we hear most about is that livestock loss cause global warming through greenhouse gas emissions. And of course, that's true, they're doing that. I mean, we humans also contribute to CO2, but livestock is also necessary to sequester carbon dioxide into the soil by maintaining grasslands, which actually need to be grazed. The whole climate gas discussion has become highly controversial. And I would like to here actually refer to a study that just came out uh, written by Ian Spoons and published by the, um, the Pastres Group, which analyzes the errors in the existing uh, calculations. For one, there's a bias towards uh, industrial systems because it's actually technically very difficult to do these studies to actually measure emissions in grazing systems. So almost all the studies are done in uh, intensive uh, stall feeding systems. And then uh, these data are used to model for the rest of the world. Uh, secondly, what has also not been considered in most of these uh, life cycle analysis is the fact that the different longevity of the climate gases and where CO2 and methane are put on the same level. And now even the IPCC is saying that we uh, you know, methane is much shorter lived and it's CO2 really, which is the long-term problem. Thirdly, there is also no systems approach. It's all about greenhouse gases per kilogram of products and the positive aspects of livestock are not considered. For instance, the fact that mobile livestock reduce the need for chemical fertilizer by directly putting the manure on the fields. Another factor is that livestock also produce skins and fiber, which are an alternative to a lot of the plastic that is around. All these things would need to go, go into calculations, into the calculation. Um, I think many livestock people would agree, maybe with the first eight points I'm making, but my ninth point is, I think, uh, controversial. Uh, and there's also the, the mantra in livestock development that efficient, high yielding livestock are in the public interest as they enable low cost access to animal sourced food and take up less space than extensively kept 
animals. And this is where I, uh, where I really disagree. And I'll go into that in the, in the moment, but can we have the next slide, please? So basically, uh, livestock is not a black and white issue. I mean, we have a wide range of systems and on one end of the spectrum, we have the traditional pastoral extensive systems which uh, maintain biodiversity, are very climate resilient. They're also positive from the um, perspective of animal welfare. And then at the other end of the spectrum, we have uh, the intensive industrialized uh, systems, which are very productive, uh, but they have negative effects on biodiversity. They cause land degradation, and they, they actually, they need a lot of antibiotics uh, to be maintained. Without antibiotics, they are probably not uh, feasible and uh, antimicrobial resistance is a, is a huge uh, issue, of course. Next, please. Next, I'm coming to, the, uh, to the, the, my critique part. Uh, and uh, in my opinion, there are two fallacies of livestock development. One is that higher yields mean higher income for farmers. And that may be true, you know, if you compare two farmers which are in the same situation and one has more, uh, you know, productive animals, he or she may, may make more profit. But basically it is so that you have the high yielding animals, you need to spend a, a lot of money on the inputs and of, very often uh, in developing countries, it's a situation that people actually spend more money on the inputs than they, they get paid for the product. And it's not much different in, uh, in the developed world where, um, Already people have, you know, farmers have the highest yielding animals, but still they're not making um, enough money and they're told to, to grow or uh, to grow or to go. And, and this is leading to that, you know, um, all the smaller enterprises disappearing and just a few big ones being left. Uh, the, the, the second point is, um, you know, efficiency is always equal with sustainability in livestock circles. And this is where I really disagree because there are many other angles to sustainability, uh, you know, such as biodiversity conservation, uh, water usage, um, animal welfare and, and, and uh, nutritional density, which are not being uh, considered. And, uh, and because we have reduced, you know, our looking at livestock just to efficiency, which is, that is why we have ended up with the systems you can see on the left. They are incredibly efficient, but they also cause a lot of problems. And they, they are one of the reasons for the backlash against livestock keeping. Next, please. So, so in conclusion, we need to leave behind this, this narrow way of looking at livestock on the basis of efficiency or feed conversion rate. And instead we have to adopt a more holistic framework such as true cost accounting that takes into account biodiversity, water usage, nutritional density and public health. Next please. Next Paul. Yeah. And here are uh, some of the you know, nine principles I've identified uh, or nine goals or, that we should work towards to make livestock more sustainable and in line with planetary uh, boundaries. And uh, the, the mantra in livestock development is always you need to intensify, but actually I believe we need to extensify. We need to use livestock to harvest biomass wherever it is available, even if it's in the, you know, the remotest areas or if it's in inner cities. Um, we need to extensify and we need to mobilize uh, uh, animals also. And we can do that by uh, providing service to mobile livestock keepers, trying to keep the one, the pastels we have still in business. We need to ensure their rights to customary grazing. And we need to also celebrate these herders as, you know, they are always, uh, depicted as backward and so on, but we actually need to depict them as environmental heroes because they manage to, you know, produce food and at the same time take care of the environment. And this really needs to be um, appreciated. We should try to feed livestock only on waste, uh, especially uh, chickens and pigs. They could, uh, um, we can sustain there's so much food waste uh, we can use that we can recycle that we should keep our ruminants on grass or on shrubs or whatever 
uh, instead of uh, using land and fertilizer to uh, grow feed for them. And it's also very important that we reintegrate livestock into the landscapes uh, and with crop cultivation. We currently, we have a situation where we have specialists for livestock and we have specialists for crop cultivation and they don't really talk to each other. And that's the reason why we have on one hand, you know, in livestock, we have these huge uh, pools of manure. We don't want to, uh, don't know what to do with them. They are extremely toxic. And um, we, on the other hand, we have, uh, we need to uh, produce chemical fertilizer to, uh, because uh, to, cut, to fertilize our field. And I mean, if we bring the two together, like we still have these agro pastoral systems in India, actually India is composed of agro-pastoral systems where after the harvest, the animals look, uh, move in and they utilize the, the whatever is left over from the harvest and at the same time they fertilize. It's a totally solar powered system at this. Um, then in terms of socioeconomic principles, we need to uh, create policy contexts where even the smaller and the medium-sized farmers are able to remain in business. And we can do this by making producers pay for the negative externalities they cause. And we can also uh, conversely pay, make payments for environmental services to those people who um, uh, keep livestock in tune with nature. I think we also need to move away from the single purpose breeds and support multifunctional breeds uh, because we have a lot of waste in the um, single purpose breeds. We have these high producing dairy cows, but the, the male calves are totally useless. I mean, they, they are sometimes they're euthanized or they are uh, allowed to die at birth. And, and so it's a very wasteful system. We also need to really invest uh, and subsidize decentralized processing infrastructure, such as uh, small slaughterhouses and networks of micro dairies. And that would not only contribute to livestock sustainability, but would also go so far in terms of rural development. Finally, and last but not least, um, we also need to look into animal welfare and we need to realize that animals are made for walking. They are much happier if they're uh, have the opportunity to walk. And we should also even try to keep them in natural social groups as pastorals do. Uh, in, as we all know, in, in commercial dairy, it's uh, uh, custom to separate calves right after birth. And, but there are also progressive dairy farmers who are calf at foot dairies who, who manage to do it and we can learn from them. And I mean, if we try to implement such approaches, then the livestock will be much more appreciated. Next slide, please. My final thought is that, you know, in the greater scheme of, of nature, uh, plants have the opportunity to uh, generate energy uh, through photosynthesis, so they can remain in one spot. Animals don't have that facility, so they need to move in order to eat the plants that store the energy. And what has happened in the last 50 years is that we have reversed that natural system. And uh, we have immobilized the animals and we are shipping you know, feed to them from the other end of the world. And in that way, we have turned a, a solar powered system into a, fuel, a fossil fuel powered system. And we urgently need to reverse that trend. And you know what I'm saying, it is just, general principles, I think, I, I realize none of this can be implemented immediately, but I, maybe it should be our long-term goal. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ilza. That was wonderful. And uh, I really like the part about solar power as system with animals walking to the fodder. And I couldn't agree more with you there. But now I must invite our panelists who've been with us to participate in the session. Our panelists today are Ms. Elizabeth Katushabe Muyambi. I hope I have it correct, Elizabeth. Yeah, right. Yeah, she wears several hats. She's a pastoralist by birth. She's a researcher and focal point for Penya, the pastoral and environmental network of the Horn of Africa in Uganda. She's also an Ankole cattle breeder and a global ambassador for pastoralism. Welcome, Elizabeth. 
Thank you Alex. so much. Thank Alex. you, Nitya. Welcome, Elizabeth. Good to see you online. Hello. Our next, I panel our next panelist is Professor Frank Michlona. Good morning, Professor. I think it's very early in the morning for you out there in California. Good morning. I'm used to early morning, mornings. Yes. Hello. <laughs> professor uh, Frank Michlona is a professor and air quality specialist in cooperative extension in the Department of Animal Science at UC Davis, California. He's also director of the CLEAR Center, which is studying the environmental and human health impacts of livestock. Our third speaker is Dr. Shirley Tarawali. Hello, Shirley. Dr. Shirley Tarawali is Assistant Director General at the International Livestock Research Institute, Ilri, based in Kenya, and Chair of the Global Agenda for Sustainable Livestock, which is also known as GAZI. Shirley has over 30 years experience implementing and leading livestock research for development and is authored and contributed to over 80 publications on the subject. Very warm welcome to you, Shirley. And finally, our fourth speaker is Dr. Per Edra. Dr. Edra is the director of the Global Food and Agribusiness Network and member of the Scientific Council of the World Farmers Organization and is based in Switzerland, which he says is beautiful Switzerland. He's also authored important publications on livestock. A very warm welcome to all of you and many thanks for joining us here today. I do hope you've all managed to go through the book. The first question, I will now pose the questions to you one by one. And the first question is about what you agreed with and what you did not perhaps agree with about the book. Elizabeth, you're the first on. You've heard the presentation and read the book. As a pastoralist and a herder, which parts of the book do you resonate with? Are there parts you do not complete, completely agree with? You have five minutes, Elizabeth. Thank you. Yeah, hi, everyone. I think I want to say that um, this book is really speaking the minds and the thoughts of the pastoralists. So the author really feels for the livestock keepers. And I think I'm really, really concerned. I agree with what she talked about regarding the people who are really in for phasing out, uh, they called it uh, uh, the anti-livestock lobbyists who think that meat should be, or livestock should be phased out by 2035. This is really, really worrying for, for the pastoralists. For example, the livestock I'm thinking of, that, like the Ankole cow, it's, uh, it, it, the meat itself is not really that bad because our meat is tasty, it's uh, nutritious, and there's, uh, it has low cholesterol. And because it has been, uh, you know, grazed through natural livestock farming. So we think that it's really very, I agree that it's unrealistic. And I believe that if we, for example, this cow, if it's uh, phased out, that means the whole, you know, human race will be phased out. And I'm thinking that our livestock is not only for, you know, for not only for our food, okay, but it's our insurance, it's our social network, it's our everything. It's uh, we sell it and buy essential commodities that we need. We pay school fees for our children. So for us, this livestock is not really equal to meat. And um, I think I also agree that. Uh, it's, as she's mentioned that it's just the problem of how these uh, animals are, you know, grazed or they are, it's the kind, the system of production that's being used. Our animals, for example, she brings out clearly that, uh, you know, she has really demystified all these myths. And I just hope that uh, everyone, all the stakeholders, the people who eat the meat or who, who utilize the livestock, those who, those of us who look at the livestock as our life and livelihood, I think we should really all read this book for sure and appreciate it. We should not look at it, uh, you know, and just uh, put it on the side like uh, many books have come up. So we look at our livestock, you know, as a valuable uh, family member because they, it, the livestock we, we are talking about, like the Ankole cow, it, it's, uh, it has social cultural values. You know, we look at it, we use it for many, many things. For example, I can mention 
when we get wives in our in our culture, we we pay dowry, and we use this as uh, you know we pay gifts to the parents of the bride. So we, for example, we use them to sustain relationships. Where if I have a friend, I give them a cow, and it will be like uh, they become part of us in the in our family, and we also. They, it has medicinal purposes. It has, uh, you know, uh, I can't talk. I mean, the list is uh, very long. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you. Thank you so much for your uh, okay. thoughts. Thank you. Your five minutes. Okay, I would now like to call on Dr. Mitlona. You're a professor and the air quality specialist in cooperative extension in the Department of Animal Science at UC Davis. Based on your work, could you tell us your response to Ilza's book? I think many of us are also very curious to know about your title of air quality specialist. Thank you. Over to you, doctor. Yeah, good morning, everybody. Oh, good. Hello. <laughs> um, thanks for having me. Um, air quality specialist uh, is a position that I'm holding, um, and that is due to the fact that livestock certainly has some unintended consequences to it, some externalities on the environmental side that can affect air quality and climate, that can cause odors and so forth. Um, they don't have to be that way. Uh, we can keep livestock in a way that uh, shows minimized impacts on the environment, um, but we have to do it right. And so what I agree with, uh, with respect to the book is first of all, the appreciation for livestock in general. I think livestock is a, an integral part of our food system. Uh, I do think that two thirds of all agricultural land in the world is in need of being used um, with livestock, uh, grazing uh, livestock for the marginal land, uh, but not only grazing livestock. So that's where I, um, that's where I would say I am a little critical that I view some of this book going into the direction of saying only grazing livestock is uh, really beneficial and the other ones are not. And, um, and I think that goes too far because uh, we also have understand that we do have nutritional needs that go beyond uh, what grazing animals can provide. And um, we have to think about um, what the FAO and other organizations are telling us, which is if we were to get rid of intensive animal agriculture, then we would have to expand the extensive agriculture. And that could go to the, um, uh, that, that could, be at the expense of some of those, uh, let's say, natural forests and so on. We don't want to see that. We do not want to see that. So uh, you might or might not agree with some of the production that occurs in parts of the developed land, of uh, developed world. And yes, there are many areas that can be improved. But um, I think we need to have a nuanced discussions, uh, discussion about that. I just give you one example. I oftentimes hear people being critical of beef production in countries like the United States. Um, the United States has about 90, 90, 90 million beef cattle. And when I see images uh, in the media, they always show feedlots where animals are pretty cramped. And it's true that for the last three to four months of their lives, these animals, these beef animals are generally in feedlots, fed a concentrate rich diet. But prior to that, prior to going into the feedlots, all beef cattle in the United States are on pasture. There are 750,000 beef ranches in the United States, 750,000 each on average 50 cows in size. Then there are 1,400 feedlots. So um, I resemble uh, the depiction, not by the book, uh, but in general, the depiction of uh, showing cramped animals in tight facilities as, um, as, the way that food is produced in parts of the developed world. Of course that happens and where it impedes animal welfare, where it leads to environmental externalities, we can do better and we should. But I think uh, we also need to appreciate that a lot of what's happening also in the developed world is, um, is not depleting, but is um, you know, producing in an intensive way, but that probably saves some of our other ecosystems. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, inputs and response. I would like to now invite Shalita Rawali. 
Shirley, you work at IDRI and presently hold the position of chair at the Global Agenda for Sustainable Development. The UNFSS debates have kept us busy this year. After this presentation, what are your thoughts on the book and what do you feel about the mix and the reality? Over to Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Nitya. Thank you too, Ilsa. Um, what do I agree with? I cannot dispute. This book is written with, with passion and commitment. I could almost hear Ilsa speaking when I read parts of it. I think it's a very timely contribution, as you said, Nitya, at this time of food system summit and a voice to raise on the importance of sustainable livestock in this ongoing debate about livestock in future food systems. And well, in its 50th year, just a new edition, I think, came out. I also agree, as the book says, that more nuance is needed when describing the livestock sector and its contribution to sustainable development. Making general statements is really not helpful, no matter where you're looking from. We do need solutions. We need solutions for all parts of the livestock sector and all production systems. Those solutions absolutely need to take that holistic perspective on all dimensions of sustainability, from environment to climate change, to human health, food and nutrition, livelihoods, gender, and so on. And really important, understand the trade-offs between them. So the principles are great, but they might need to be somewhat differentially applied. Not all will be implemented in the same way, in the same place, in, in different places across the world. I agree that efficiency is really multifaceted and complicated. Efficiency alone cannot deliver a sustainable food system, but it should be part of it. That the situation is challenging and urgent, no matter which of those development dimensions we look at, it's challenging and it's urgent. Uh, there were a few things, and a bit similar to Frank actually, that I didn't quite agree with. Some of the tone and focus of the, bo of the book, especially with regard to the to in intensive or industrial uh, farming systems, which absolutely do have some ills that need to be fixed. But I think we have to be honest that all systems of livestock production need to improve in one way or another. Maybe they don't all need to improve in the same way, but all need to improve, need to address these multiple um, sustainability dimensions. All of them also have some good aspects that must be developed and applied in other contexts. And that all parts are really starting to step up to make changes to address sustainability dimensions. So again, that need for nuance and not oversimplifying. And I think we need to be quite careful, as I've indicated, about making broad and blanket statements about livestock or even about the ways of producing livestock. No matter what you say, it's going to be wrong if it's applied across the whole sector because of the huge diversity of different species, of different commodities, of different ways of producing them and so on. So I found some of the myths and truths to have that feel of sweeping statements, if you like. Uh, most are true to a greater or lesser extent in certain situations. In fact, I was just uh, reading and I came across this term infodemic, um, which talks about this sort of spread of all kinds of accurate and inaccurate information all getting mixed up together, facts and rumors and fears and making it very difficult, especially for people who are perhaps not experts in a, in a particular field, to learn the essential information about an issue. And I say, well, maybe some of that's been happening in the livestock sector. Um, so let's be a little bit careful when we use facts and figures and references um, and, and try not to be selective with those that we use, bring, bring balance to those kind of discussions. Thank you, Nitya. Thank you, Shirley. Thank you very much for putting your thoughts across. I think they are very valuable. And finally, the fourth, uh, our fourth panelist, Dr. Edera, Pei Edera, you quoted the book Cows, Milk and Climate. In the presentation, are there positions you completely agree with or disagree with? Which ones are they and why? Over to you. 
So, uh, first of all, I want to congratulate Ilse on this book. Um, it is always a pleasure when you read books and publications from authors where you can feel in every word and every sentence the passion, and but also the deep expertise. Uh, and, and, and Ilse clearly has that and it shines through the book and that makes this book valuable and unique. And it's always a pleasure to, to read such kind of publications. Um, so for, from, from that point alone, I can only recommend to not only read it, but also spread it around and, and recommend the book. Um, I, 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 I think I believe I agree with just about everything that's in this book. Um, uh, and uh, uh, want to just highlight one issue that that is often overlooked and which Ilse has uh, has pointed out. The uh, what, what she calls intensification, and I would like to rather rephrase it, not intensification, but commoditization. When we started turning animals and animal production systems into commodities, that is when many of the difficulties and ills of this uh, of our livestock industry developed. And it is not true that this was in the interest or is in the interest of the farming community. Even among uh, uh, highly oriented commodity production farmers in the developed world, it is ultimately not in their, uh, certainly not in their economic interest, but not even in their social or cultural interest. Um, most of these farmers were kind of forced into this direction by regulatory pressures, by subsidy systems that were being created. Um, and and uh, they, I, I believe most farmers who are operating under these systems feel like they are being trapped in a, in a cul-de-sac and would, would like to get out of this one-way street and, and back into an area where artisanal production uh, and differentiated production close to your customer production uh, is, is again valued by the entire value chain, uh, by, the, by the processors, by the, and, and the ultimate uh, end consumer. We, we see this all over the place where, where those farmers who are able to create a, a value chain all the way down to the consumer and, and, and are able to sell non-commoditized livestock products, um, that, they, that their economics and their, and, and their social standing increases uh, much higher over their existing uh, trap of being in a commoditized food production system. So I would, uh, I, uh, and, and there I would like to kind of, switch over, where, where, where do I see criticism in the book? Where do I not agree? Ilse pointed out in her introduction that, we are, that this topic is um, in so many places in the public and among experts so hopelessly polarized that it's very difficult to actually have a constructive discussion. And um, I, I would have wished, um, and I know how difficult it is, uh, that that she would have refrained from some polarizations herself, um, in particular around the issue of intensive uh, uh, livestock systems. I, I don't want to repeat what Jerry just said. I don't think it is helpful to anybody if we try to vilify uh, certain production systems at the expense of everybody else. I think there, there's, we, we need to agree on a target of where we want to be, which is that animals should be living in a respected and, and healthy environment uh, that, that also makes productive economic, social and cultural sense for those livestock keepers. And uh, in some places, um, more intensive production systems may be justified than less intensive production systems, but where to draw the line of what is intensive or what is not intensive, I think it is very difficult to make a definition. This is intensive, this is not intensive. I don't think that that helps us further in this debate. Um, 
especially now that with the methods of physician livestock technologies that are coming onto the market that enable us to, to uh, keep animals uh, even under uh, uh, tight production systems, but still are able to keep them healthy, keep them productive, keep them even socially engaged. Um, I think that aspect of precision livestock uh, technologies is, is not highlighted enough in the book. Um, so uh, to, to, to round up my comment here, um, we, we should talk more about the vision of where we want to be. Um, if the vision is livestock uh, is an important asset to society, uh, it is a respected asset in society and farmers, processors, retailers, consumers and society at large will gain from a, a respected and respectable livestock keeper community, then if that's the target, then let's move towards the target, but let's not polarize among ourselves on, on what's bad and what's good. Thank you, Dr. Edgar, for your points. Uh, I think they're much appreciated. Isa, would you like to respond? Um, yeah, it's a little bit difficult to respond to all these wide ranging comments. Um, just as a bit of background, I have, obviously, I mean, we all, uh, you know, have a certain, we're exposed to certain types of livestock systems and to certain situations, and that is clouding our, uh, our thinking about it. And I, uh, happen to have spent the last 30 years mostly among pastoralists and I've, I've, I see uh, how they are producing food without any inputs and with happy animals and with a close relationship to the, to the animals and for me as an animal lover that is very attractive. Uh, so, so I'm colored by, by my experiences obviously. Um, just to, so I'm very much on the line of Elizabeth obviously, yeah. Um, so I just want to respond to some of the comments, um, starting with Frank, who said, uh, who doubted that only grazing livestock is beneficial. I agree. I mean, that is a little bit, that's a bit extreme. Um, you don't have to graze your livestock, but I mean, you can, it's okay with feeding the livestock. Um, depending on your environment in some you have rich environments there's a lot of biomass and you can you don't need to let your animals graze and i i do want to refer to a, a study by the university of wagening and uh, they have calculated that if we fed uh, livestock only on waste and uh, the western countries would reduce their uh, intake of livestock products to a, a little bit uh, then we could still uh, increase the uh, you know the, the the intake in developing countries of livestock products so so these uh, calculations are there i mean they they show that it is possible to just um, keep animals on on waste so uh, yeah i maybe it's over ambitious what i have outlined and it's it may be true that i i'm a little bit extreme and um, but i do think uh, Exactly, I agree with Pierre. I mean, it's this commodity approach to livestock, which is, has also has has not been good to either farmers or to uh, or to the animals. And uh, promoting that approach now in uh, uh, and that's what it boils down to. You, know, you you need more output, more output. Uh, that's what it what it boils down to, and that's why I put in that point that if farmers are told you know they need to have more output, it's not necessarily um, uh, good for them. And I. Uh, you know, and in, in developing countries, in India, for instance, they were always looking to, to the West. I mean, the cows, they give 30 liters or 40 liters and our cows only give four or five liters. And so, and, and whereas India, India is actually the largest producer of milk. It is also uh, the largest exporter of uh, sheep and goats, and it is the largest exporter of beef, uh, meaning buffalo meat, actually. And most of this product is produced in agro-pastoral systems. Uh, we have calculations showing that 70% of India's meat is, comes from these uh, traditional extensive systems, and that about 50% uh, of its milk as well. So, 
So this is pretty uh, uh, amazing, really, you know, that a densely populated country like India can be so productive uh, and then still being, um, you know, accused by its animal scientists of being kind of low, uh, low productive or not. I mean, and it, the, the livestock in India has so many uh, positive benefits for, uh, for the farmers because everything here is still integrated. Um, so I've been colored by living in India as well and seeing the alternatives to uh, what we have in the developed countries. Yes, that's my, uh, my response. <laughs> okay, thank you, Ilza. thank you. Thank you, Ilza, for your response. I now move on to the second question, the panelists. It, uh, this, the question is, can each of you suggest two important actions which are immediately needed to make livestock rearing more sustainable in farmers fit for the future? And again, I go in the same order. Elizabeth, Uganda has extensive systems of livestock rearing. It also has a small holder, it also has small holder systems as well as intensive systems, which have been introduced fairly recently. I see some comments in the chat from Africa. If, if you were Minister for Livestock, which I hope you will be, which, which programs or actions would you like to support which are sustainable in the future? Over to you, Elizabeth. Yeah, thank you, Nitya. I think uh, the, the improving the infrastructure, for example, in the rangelands, uh, when, uh, for example, we have these local processing facilities like abattoirs and uh, milk processing plants near our villages, Maybe we would avoid, for example, transporting and uh, stressing our livestock, you know, taking them to the cities. And uh, maybe we should, we would create jo more jobs for our youths and uh, we reduce the, you know, the movement or migration from, from the villages to, to, the, to the cities. So I think this would be very important for us. And, I can also, so would, uh, if I became the minister, I would, for example, make sure that in this rangeland, because there's a lot of investment that's happening, you know, there's, um, there's uh, mining, there is, there's industrialization happening in, along the cattle corridor. And if we could do, maybe create zones and agree that certain parts of the, the rangeland should be left to the pastoralists to continue using their indigenous knowledge to breed the livestock. You know, livestock like uh, use a said that can walk, that can respond when you call them by their names. And this, these uh, livestock, they are, they are resilient under these climate changes and uh, also the diseases. So this would be very important. And they say, I would say these areas are for industries, but we create corridors for the livestock so that they can reach and access uh, grazing areas. I think this would be really helpful. I think it's an action that is, uh, um, that's uh, really feasible and it can, it can work. It's, it's easy to, to apply. So I can say that uh, as uh, if we really have, we have proper policies, carefully thought out policies and uh, people are refusing to use the word extensify, but I think I support this. And we would, you know, we would reduce the use of veterinary drugs, for example, antibiotics and their chemical acaricides that we use to, you know, to keep all these uh, host and fresh and crossbreeds that have been introduced in our community. And we should, we would reduce them and protect our animal genetic resource and also protect the biodiversity because it's really gone because of the, the chemicals or the bees or the birds or the butterflies, everything is dead. We cut all the trees because of the problem of uh, keeping this uh, foreign exotic cow that cannot survive without uh, the strong antibiotics and chemicals to keep it in this harsh environment that can only accommodate the indigenous breed, the Ankole cow and other local indigenous breeds of Uganda. So those are the actions that I think would are uh, viable. Thanks a lot, Elizabeth. Thank you. I, I, I'll see if I can have somebody. If, uh, I hope you do become minister someday. The <laughs> next question is to Dr. Mitlona, Professor Mitlona. 
your blog statement, your blog has a statement, I won't tell you what to think and I certainly won't tell you what to eat. Our question is, please tell us what actions are immediately needed on livestock farms in the US to make them sustainable. And I have a small follow-up question, that's just mine. What meat would you serve at your table if Ilza visits you? Uh, the second question was, what, what meat would what I serve? What meat would you serve Ilza if she visits you for dinner or, or lunch someday? <laughs> Oh, um, you can so, how, so, so how do we make our meat more sustainable? I think what's really important is that we understand what the environmental externalities are of our, um, of our meat production. And, uh, and, there are, and there are numerous ones, uh, and they can be significant. So, uh, for example, the large concentration of livestock does lead to um, consequences such as uh, air pollutants or uh, odors and so forth. We have to uh, find a happy medium of, um, of producing livestock. Uh, and yes, livestock, in my opinion, is a, um, a food commodity. Uh, of, but that doesn't mean that I don't value the life of livestock. I do value them as, as creatures that we, have to, uh, that we have to treat with utmost respect but they are still a food commodity. Um, so in my opinion, we have to treat them with respect and sometimes that's not happening. Sometimes they are, as, uh, as Pierre said, um, you know, just dealt with as if they were you know, grain or so, which they are not. Um, I think we have to be more compassionate in general. And um, that is true for all livestock species, for livestock and poultry species. Uh, and that's oftentimes missing in my opinion. It's, uh, it's about the money and it's not about um, what we're dealing with, which are living creatures with a sense of pain and, and pleasure and so forth. Um, I do think that um, despite all the criticism that livestock producers get, a lot of it is going in the right direction. Uh, where I see problems are, um, there, there are situations where we have cases of animal abuse and I think wherever that happens, it needs to be stamped out immediately. Other farmers need to self-police and report uh, bad players to the officials so that these negative cases can really uh, be a part of the, the past. Um, what would I serve you? Well, uh, first I would ask you if you uh, have any preferences like a good host would. Um, and, um, but, if you were to just leave it to me, I mean, I am a real lover of beef and, um, and of lamb as well, um, but I don't discriminate. Uh, I, I like all of them. <laughs> I would make sure that we have a nice balance of, uh, of vegetables and, and meat, and, uh, and uh, I think we would have a good time. Thank you. You have an invitation then, Liz. Cheers. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I would invite all of you. I would invite all of you. And I, uh, I think that we would have a very pleasant time together. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Shirley, uh, the next, you're, the, you're next. At Gazel, we often speak about the theory of change and being able to influence policymakers in the next 10 years to adopt more sustainable livestock systems. What particular messages can we take to speak with governments to make them change and become more sustainable? I mean, and also, of course, what do we need to do to go ahead? I thought we'd I'd link it to making governments change. Okay. I'd yeah, the time. I, that's, Thank you. That's, no problem. No problem. I, I mean, to me, the, one of the key things is to try and get out of these dichotomous or polarized uh, uh, conversations. We've just got to foster that connection and diversity across the sector, and that probably applies within a country and across a government as, as much as it does across the world. Um, I was a little bit hesitant actually at one point to join this conversation because I wanted to raise this caution though about not dismissing any part of the sector, but acknowledging the need to change and improve everywhere. And that every system can contribute to better sustainability. Ilsa, I think in her beginning overview talked about learning. Pastoral systems have a lot to give and a lot 
that other systems can learn from. Equally, there are systems where there's smart technologies. Pear mentioned the precision and um, agriculture. Those things could really contribute to helping in completely different situations across the world. So making that connection, having us all work together towards shared values, shared agendas, whatever perspective we start from, that's, I think, a, a, a key thing here. And of course, one of my roles in the, in the Gazel. I think it's really important that we recognize the urgency too. If we're to meet sustainable development goals and turn around those downward trends of poverty and hunger and climate change, livestock have to be part of that solution. But for that to happen, a second action is to be able to deploy much better and much smarter, both sophisticated technologies, but also those indigenous approaches and skills, the sorts of things that we've heard and seen in the chat talked about with such passion today. We really do need to all sit at the same table and work together and not to have parallel different tracks going on. That's my thoughts, thank you. Thank you, Shirley. And actually, thank you for leading me, uh, I mean, for setting the tone for the next presenter. Uh, hey, if I may call you that, you've authored How to Feed the World in 2050, where you also speak of technologies in the livestock sector. What technologies or choices would you back for a more sustainable livestock future? And my, that's my main question to you. And also, of course, what do you think is a what, what's a way forward for us, sustainable livestock? Thank you. I think there's a, a just there, there's not a single technology that will carry us to the future. We we have a broad range of technologies. Uh, most of them have some aspect of digitalization with them. Uh, so whether we're talking about genetics, uh, by the way, genetics for both the breeds of the animals, but also for the breeds of the feed to the animals. So whether we talk about genetics, whether we're talking about um, animal behavior observation in, in the places of where they're being kept, tracking and monitoring uh, the livestock that we have to protect them from dangers, to be able to um, uh, treat them medically when they are about to get sick before we have to come in with heavy antibiotics. Um, and so on. There's, there are so many different ways. And then we get the tracking and tracing systems of also controlling quality throughout the entire value chain. So there's so many different technologies. The, the question is not, do we have the technologies? Yes, we have them, but how can we get them installed in the field? And all of these technologies, all of these improvements ultimately require investment. We need to invest. And that does not call for the government to provide subsidies. That, that calls for governments and regulatory systems to provide a reasonable degree of long-term stability so that private investors, entrepreneurs, farmers will make those investments. Uh, many of these investment horizons related to livestock are span for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, sometimes even 30 years. And we need stability in the investment conditions so that the the, the, the keepers of the livestock and the, and the farmers and the investors have, have secure conditions. And they say, oh, I'm investing into this breed, I'm investing in that monitoring system, I'm investing in that production system, I can recover my investments at a profit. If we provide these long-term stability, stable conditions, the, the technology deployment and the improvements along every indicator will follow automatically. Um, and uh, so, so here I would ask for, for government and regulatory systems to provide uh, reasonable long-term stability so that investments can be facilitated. I, um, I also want to answer your question on what would I want to serve. Uh, if I had the opportunity, my, one of my favorite dishes is uh, uh, sitting in, in, in Ethiopia in a mid-sized town or even in the capital of Addis Abeba and uh, there they have this fantastic meat specialty from, from uh, uh, grazed cows, grazed cattle, uh, well-hung meat, which is then 
cut out of the open carcass and consumed raw on the plate, maybe with a little bit of a Berbera spice. Uh, it is a, such a fantastic taste and texture in this uh, very originally kept uh, uh, cattle, uh, cattle breeds and processing technology uh, so that these uh, food that these foods can be consumed uh, uh, without any fear of, of disease or anything. It's a, just a, a really, really um, pleasant way to uh, eat uh, uh, well tasting, well structured livestock product, these meats. Um, I, I, Ethiopia is the only place where I know that meat is being served as raw cubes in such a way and it's it, it's just so tasty every time i'm in addis ababa i, I make a point of having having these uh, cattle meat being uh, in, uh, and enjoying them wow thank you <laughs> raw meat not scared of antibiotics not scared of disease i'm impressed <laughs> thank you thank you very much um ilza would you like to respond well, I mean, there's not that much to respond now. Uh, I'm, we'll plan a few meetings here um, in California <laughs> and in uh, Addis and so on. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hopefully we won't do Zoom anymore and the next year will be better. Yeah. And we can have face-to-face -face meetings. Uh, thank you to all the panelists for your wonderful, wonderful contributions. Really happy that you could join us. Frank, McLona, early in the morning, <laughs> we've got you out, and uh, everybody else. I think I can take a few questions from the floor, from the, uh, from the chat box. Uh, I have one question. I mean, I don't, it's not really addressed to anybody in particular, but any of you can take it. Stephen Blakeway has a question. Many have the impression that feedlot cattle are eating soy meal from the Amazon or equivalent climate and biodiversity dis destructive feeds. If grass fed young cattle need to be plumped up on other feed, then the whole system needs to be evaluated. Where is the truth in this? And what about intensive pig production? Perhaps this question will go to you, Frank McLean. Frank. Yeah, so uh, the story that's produced in the Amazon is um, you're largely produced for its oil, not for the the meal, the soy meal, soybean meal, but the soybean meal does, of course, go into uh, intensive animal agriculture, and that's mainly monogastric animals. Okay, it goes into pigs and poultry, not into beef. Um, here in the United States, uh, the Amazon produced beef is not really making it into supply chains. The majority of that goes to China and Egypt. Uh, that is where the majority of the Brazilian beef that's exported goes to. Um, so I'm not sure what the rest of the question was, but... Uh, 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 do you want me to read it again? So there was the... Uh, just, uh, the just the highlight. Just the yeah. highlight of it. So it's where is the truth in this? You, you've answered a bit about grass-fed cattle. And what about intensive pig production? Yeah, so monogastric animals have to eat... Um, either soy or corn or other intensive or normally uh, do eat more uh, concentrate based diets. And therefore there's more of a food feed competition uh, between monogastric livestock on the one hand, livestock and poultry on the one hand and humans on the other. Whereas uh, ruminant livestock is less of a competition because the majority of what they eat is non-human edible, oftentimes upcycled cellulose rich, uh, you know, grass, as well as legumes and so on, and, and all different kinds of byproducts and co-products. Globally, according to the FAO, 84%, that's 8.4, of the feed that we feed globally to livestock and poultry is non-human edible. Much of it is upcycled, as I described, uh, upcycled cellulose and so on. So can we do better? Yes, we can do better. Um, but I think uh, a lot of what goes into our livestock and poultry is... Um, is non-human edible. And a lot of that are byproducts and co-products that otherwise would not be eaten. So for example, in our dairies, we feed about 50% silage. The other 50% are things such as uh, almond hulls and cotton seeds and all different kinds of byproducts and co-products that otherwise 
would land up on some landfills or so. Um, but we can improve, for sure we can improve, no, no question. Um, Thank you. Can I tell? Yeah, sure. Yes, I'm, um, I mean, this is actually an issue that this um, soybean thing is an issue we talked about in the regional Basel meeting, uh, for instance, in Vietnam, and I think also in China, I mean, they used to have uh, local pigs, which could uh, make use of the, you know, the local, the, the, the waste and, and whatsoever. And then, uh, I mean, these high yielding, efficient um, pigs were imported from Canada and other places, and they, of course, need uh, soybeans and corn in order. So, so that has led to a huge uh, import of soybeans. And also, and the imports have made it possible to uh, have like industrial intensive or whatever you want to big, uh, the, the pig density has amazing, has incredibly increased there. And that now may also be uh, give rise to more pandemics now because we have so many animals uh, concentrated in one spot and it's only possible because it's, uh, you know, it's all based on imported uh, feed. Uh, I don't know the situation in detail, but I mean, this is what I surmise from, from what I'm reading. I'm happy to be educated differently. Thank you, Ilza. Uh, now, the next question to you, because two people have commented on this. In the book, Ilza says the neglect of pastoralism has made it an unattractive career choice for young people. My question is, what steps are needed to revive the interests of young people towards pastoralism? This is from Abhishek Jain in India. And we have uh, Chloe Stoll Lane also reiterating the question from Africa. So who's, who's answering that? Are you? Are you, 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 you. Oh, I'm, <laughs> so, uh, I'm doing nothing. Yes, but you also have experience actually in that is in in that field. So. Um, mm. That's I mean in India, for instance, it's only uh, it's. Grazing livestock is only something for the illiterate young. Now, as soon as you've gone to school, you are something better. You don't want to have anything to do with livestock uh, or herding, doing something backward like that. I mean, there are a few exceptions of, uh, for instance, I, I'm very fortunate to have a camel herder who just loves his job and he couldn't stand living in the city. And uh, I mean, mostly it's, they need appreciation, uh, you know, respect for what they are doing and not be treated as, you know, the somebody very back, backward or dumb or so and, and it's a respect and I'm, I think they're very important to maintain ecosystems you know which are good for both livestock and for wildlife so we, we should give them as I said something like environmental hero you know, they are environmental heroes in many ways because it's very hard it's a hard life herding animals every day you know I mean uh, you are out there in whatever uh, weather and temperature you have to take care of the animals. It's not an easy job. It's not romantic at all. It has its highlights, but it's also very hard and people need to get recognition and respect for that. And uh, Maya mentioned in the chat that uh, there's the European Shepherds Network. I mean, there are schools for shepherds in many places in Europe and I think also taking on in, in the US and in South Africa. and. Uh, I mean, I think we need to link those two issues, you know, extensive livestock keeping and nature conservation. And unfortunately, uh, you know, we have an institutional split. Uh, you know, you have a ministry for an environment which hates livestock. And then you have a ministry of animal husbandry and agriculture. And they think these pastoralists are, uh, you know, they, they, they are unproductive. So we actually, we would need a, you know, a ministry for natural resources where both activities, taking care of nature and uh, taking care of livestock are, you know, go together. Okay, thank you, Ilza. I have a question now, which there, Mazan. Yeah. yeah. Could I make a small comment on that point? Sure, sure. Yeah, I just, I think we maybe need to move our eyes a little bit away from just the production livestock keeping side when we talk about engaging young people, not just in pastoral systems, but, but more generally perhaps, because especially where you have systems that, as we just said, need to, need to change a lot and we need new technologies and solutions and the digital things that Pear just talked about, here are where there's new opportunities for young people to be part of 
of, of changing those systems for the better. So I think there are opportunities that we need to sort of broaden our thinking. How can we use digital technology to help with better animal health management, et cetera, et cetera. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Shali. Uh, I have a question here from Mazanga Suzanne Mohn. I hope I got the name right. She's also in disagreement that animals should be grown on grazing systems because even in developing countries like Malawi, we cannot afford that because even though we only have about a one million cows, but as of now, we're scrambling for grazing land due to expanded crop production and construction. But we are now going for intensive where at least with two to five cows being housed in milk within the homestead. Mm. So that's a comment that's come from Malawi. Any takers? Yes, I mean, I could, you know, Malawi is a fairly fertile area. If you have lots of crop byproducts, then it's totally okay to feed your, I mean, you to intensively feed your livestock on that. There's absolutely no problem because it's locally generated biomass. So it's, it's totally fine. It's not about, in that case, you know, taking feed from, you know, bringing it in from Brazil or Argentina and, uh, and cutting down, you know, either replacing the pampa or cutting down rainforest. Right? So that kind of intensification, if the climate and environment permits, because lots of local biomass is available, I, I have no problems with that at all. Thank you. I hope you got your answer, uh, Susanna. Uh, we now have a question on technology, which we'd like to take. That's from Bill Grayson. Adopting new technology is a big part of the UNFSS approach, but how can smaller and poorer farmers obtain the means to acquire these new aids or ideas? If I may try to answer this, uh, uh, Nitya. I, I again, I believe if, if we do this right, and I think we, we have the option to do this right, with, with uh, digitalization technologies such as blockchain, such as uh, financial tech, fintech instruments to be able to pay uh, farmers even in small denominations, uh, uh, to be able to certify provenance of product, uh, uh, better micro technologies of uh, small scale abattoirs and small scale processing technologies that are nonetheless very efficient. So, so with these, with these uh, uh, technologies, we are going to be able to leapfrog many of the forces which have in the past uh, uh, pushed this commoditization um, because much of the commoditization was also about uh, channeling and aggregating large flows of product. But the, the digitalization technologies allow us to, to uh, uh, bring bring the, the valorization opportunity of a livestock product into an end consumer market um, and, and create visibility, transparency on these micro markets. And uh, I, I see that actually happening all over Africa um, uh, where, where you have these micro markets being uh, developed and they're using they're using a, a, a mobile phone money to to pay for these things and so on. So, so uh, I think we should we should not underestimate the forces that are able that are available with these new digital technologies to create market opportunities in the entire value chain. Um, we should we should always. I want to also reemphasize what Shirley said. We, we always have to think of the whole chain from the keeper of the livestock all the way down to the consumer. And there we have, there's, there's fantastic technologies capable of, of bringing markets to producers and in and, and, and micro uh, uh, circumstances and in this way create valorization opportunity. And when you get valorization opportunity, you will also get production. And, 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 and then people will tend to care, take care of these animals in, uh, automatically so that, so that they're productive for them, that they're efficient for them. Um, and, and, and then we start getting uh, triple wins and quadruple wins automatically. Thank you. Thanks a lot for that. Uh, I have maybe a, co it's a comment come a question. It's not really a question from Padma Kumar. 
What about high income countries dissuading their large farmers from mass production and buying livestock products from low and middle income countries where the production is by the masses, socially inclusive, using less, uh, using resources like crop residues, for example? I don't know if there's a take up for this a question or just a statement. Does anybody want to take this on? Do you want me to repeat it? Yes, please. Maybe I'll give you a little case study example from here in Germany. So I live in Switzerland, but in Germany. So, so we have a, in a small mountain area in Germany called the Rhone, and it's a it's a high elevation place. And part of the part of the bio uh, security, by, by part of the biosphere of that Rhone, is a special breed of sheep called Rhone schaf. So it's a, it's a Rhone sheep, and 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 this must be part of the ecosystem otherwise otherwise the whole ecosystem of that high elevation mountainous area doesn't work and uh, so this sheep has always been extinct but it has been revitalized and and it's now doing wonders to the biodiversity of this mountain area it is also very tasty and so there is a huge demand for these sheep um, so so uh, for these sheep products so local local people cannot get as much as uh, from it as they want and the and the farmers they can also not produce as much as they like and what is the bottleneck the bottleneck is that there is not enough abattoir capacity to to uh, slaughter these sheep and and why is there not enough abattoir capacity well because we have an overall political climate in germany uh, where we want to discourage uh, animal production. We want to reduce animal production and not increase capacity. So, so here is a product that can, consumers demand, producers want to develop, um, uh, the ecosystem requires it, but the political system does not, is not conducive to allow these markets to happen. And, and so these sort of stories, they happen all over the place. Um, and, and it's an example for how the narrative of we must reduce livestock production is entirely counterproductive towards achieving what we actually want to achieve. We want to achieve a livestock production systems that are harmonious with nature, that are harmonious with, with the, 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 uh, the livestock keepers, harmonious with the production chain and uh, with everything, but, but with, with a narrative of we must reduce we cannot let these solutions bloom. Um, and, and this is just one example from one area of Germany, but, but it happens dozens, hundreds, thousands of times all over the place. Thank you. Thank you for that. I, I'll take this last question and then perhaps we can wrap up. It, it, it's been an excellent session. So Maurizio Dioli, all the principles mentioned by Ilza are excellent. But can they be ap applicable to all countries, especially industrialized countries uh, in the UN, etc.? In my opinion, no. It's also necessary to note that in a developed world, a sale price of livestock products obtained from livestock kept free ranging and fed only natural fodders, such, such as example, Parmesan cheese or Yamon Iberico is not affordable. So... Did you get that, Dilza? Do you want me to read it again? I didn't uh, get it. I'm trying to look at it in the chat. Um, okay, it's all the principles mentioned. It's there also in the WhatsApp. Yeah, yeah. Okay, it can't be uh, uh, implemented in the developed uh, countries. That's basically, is that the, is that what you're saying? Uh, yeah, no, I can read it again. Uh, um, all the principles mentioned by you are excellent, but can they be applicable to all countries, especially in the industrialized EU? And okay. uh, it's probably no. Yeah, no, exactly. I mean, my opinion on that is um, that actually the, the cheap livestock products that we get in the supermarkets, they are massively subsidized. Uh, and without the subsidies, they wouldn't be as, uh, as cheaply available. I think it's um, something like 720 billions per year, US dollar are spent every year to subsidize uh, agriculture. And much, most of that goes to the, um, 
industrial food systems and not to the, some of it also may go in the EU to small, uh, small producers, but most of it goes to subsidizing and upholding these, you know, the, the com commercial uh, commodity uh, production. And, and this is so, so the, the system is actually totally distorted. Uh, it's not that these guys can uh, produce cheaper or so they can only do it because they get, it, it's massively subsidized and that those things need to be looked into. There's a political will uh, to support, uh, uh, in, I hardly dare to use it anymore, industrial intensive system, there's a political will to support them. And, and, and that is really the problem. I mean, there's no uh, level playing field. And obviously, I mean, uh, Parmesan cheese and so on, they, they, are more, they are going to be more expensive. We are, at the moment, we're not paying the right price for, for most livestock products. But it's a huge issue. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Ilse. Um, yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, Mariam was also raising, I think, a similar point and... Uh, uh -huh. Yes. Uh, what was it? She's made a point that we're currently in a situation exactly. where in almost all countries, the perverse incentives such as large subsidies for commercial feedlots and nothing, not even sufficient development funding yeah. for extensive systems. We also had a comment below about agroecological systems not receiving money. And to redress this balance, we do need to point out the fallacies and compare and contrast the two systems. It's a way to bring issues to the core, but it does not negate the fact there's a huge diversity of systems in yeah. between. Um, yeah, so I think we've uh, probably coming to the end of the session, and I'm sure there are a lot more questions than this discussion can go on, but I think we're meeting again in California and Addis Ababa, so we carry the discussions. And uh, finally, uh, there's someone in our midst who's been hiding behind the chat boxes and presentations, who's played a very important role in bringing this book to stage. Thank you very much, Paul, Paul Mundy. A uh, little bird tells me, Paul, that there's another project you're jointly working with on with Ilza. So maybe you'd like to show us what that is. A uh, snapshot of what else, what is the other project you're doing with Ilza? Uh, okay, thank you, Nitya. Um, let me just share my screen. Let me just say that Paul is the layouter of the book. Uh, without Paul, it wouldn't be anything like it is. Anybody who needs a layout or contact uh -huh. and editor also, he identifies the gaps. Okay, thank you. Um, on, on your screen, I hope you can see uh, a slide that we flashed earlier um, of a map of pastoralists around the world. Um, you can find this on the League for Pastoralist People uh, People's website, that's www.pastoralpeoples.org and you look for the pastoralist map. And we are trying to put on this map um, the locations and a description of all of the pastoralist groups around the world. Um, we, it's not complete yet. If you were to scroll over to the Americas, you can see that we don't have very many groups in the Americas yet. And we have many countries that are still missing. But uh, I'd encourage you, if you're interested in pastoralism, to have a look at this. And if you'd like to contribute information about this, then please do get in touch with me uh, via Ilza or um, via the address uh, on the screen. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. If you haven't read the book as yet, please do look for it in the link post in the chat box. We also look forward to meeting you all again at the launch of the next book by Ilza, which is called Herding. Till then, good, good night, good evening, goodbye. Thank you very much. I'm signing off now. Thanks. Thank you very much, everybody. And Ilza, would, if anybody else wants to say something else, you're most welcome. Oh, yeah, thank yeah. you. I do want to thank the panelists. Uh, I, I really appreciate that you agreed to, uh, to be here, and I appreciate all your comments. And I hope it was a small contribution to bridging the gap between the different camps. And I also hope that we do eventually adopt a more comprehensive view of sustainability and not just look at food conversion rate. Um, so uh, I, I think it's been a, a good evening and uh, evening here anyway. And so and thanks also to all the people who attended and, and uh, put questions in the chat. And we hope to see you. Soon again, wherever.
wherever it is. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye.